Hi, I'd like to thank Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Hi, welcome to Astro Journey UK. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about the five things that I wish I knew about astrophotography when I very first started this hobby three years ago. So if you'd like to find out more, then keep watching. I started this hobby three years ago. I'd say I'm just about coming out of the beginner stage. I'm not quite sure where those boundaries lie, but um, I've learned a good deal over the past three years, and that's still fresh in my memory, so I thought it would be good time, it would be a good time to actually share this with you. This video is going to be primarily talking about deep sky astrophotography, so just bear in mind that there are many different other types of astrophotography, things like nightscapes, uh, solar, and planetary. So this is talking about nebula and galaxies. So if you're interested in that, then hang around and keep watching. So the first tip is use what you already have and only buy what you need. And so what I mean by this is um, a lot of people that sort of get into astrophotography will already be into photography in the first place. They'll already maybe have a digital SLR, they might have a few lenses and things like that. So therefore, it's it's worth just considering that and saying, OK, I can still use this camera and this lens to take some deep sky astrophotography. Um, one thing that sort of people don't necessarily know is uh, nebulae uh, can be pretty big in the night sky. Uh, we can't see them with the unaided, unaided uh, human eye, but cameras can and they're actually pretty big. So typically I quite often use a 250 millimeter Red Cat 51 telescope these days. Um, and that's not too far off the 70 to 200 millimeter uh, telephoto lens that I had with my digital SLR. And that's actually what I first started out using. You can use a, an SLR and a 200 millimeter lens and you can capture really good images of Andromeda, for example, which is our nearest galaxy, which is the width of five full moons. Don't think when you get into this, oh, I've got to buy all of this new kit, it's really expensive. Yes, it is really expensive, so therefore start slow and build up. One thing when I say buy the things that you need, for deep sky astrophotography, it's certainly you're in a much better position if you have uh, what's called an equatorial mount. So this is a mount which tracks the night sky at the rotation or the speed of the Earth's rotation. So it allows you to um, affix the camera and lens pointed at a particular target and track that target throughout the night. So that enables you to take um, multiple minutes worth of exposures in one time without getting any stars, trails and things like that. The one that I first started out with was the uh, Skywatcher Star Adventurer. Um, it's a very manual setup, so it's it solves the equatorial bit, but you still have to um, star hop in order to be able to get into where exactly you want to take an image of, for example. This can be quite difficult in light polluted skies, uh, so that's a bit of a challenge, but I found that still bizarrely enjoyable spending an evening under the night sky trying to find uh, the targets that I wanted to take photographs of. So again, things like Andromeda, I took um, also images of the Heart Nebula and the Sol Nebula uh, with this, this particular setup. So it's possible, it's just more of a challenge. Uh, there are other things um, a bit like the, the Star Adventurer. So the Skywatcher AZ GTI mount is actually a go-to mount. It's a fairly similar size to the Star Adventurer, um, but it's got that ability to be able to um, go directly to a particular target in the night sky. But the problem with um, one of those devices is you then need more kit in order to be able to use it. So it's always better to start simple. You've got also the benefits of the Star Adventurer type mounts that mean that you can go out to somewhere that's a dark sky location um, and you can benefit from some dark skies there as well. So when you are actually at the point where you need to buy some kit, i.e. rather than just not rather than just wanting to buy some kit, then some things that are worth considering. I would say a go-to mount, but one that has a sufficient capacity in terms of the payload, the weight of the scope, the weight of the camera, etc., etc. One that gives you a little bit of breathing room and flexibility in terms of if you enjoy the hobby and you grow, then you will want to invest in other kit that are heavier. 
So look at a, a go-to mount that has the capacity for future-proofing yourself a little bit more. Um, also, one thing that you're very likely to need, unless you're very lucky, is uh, light pollution fil filters. Um, so it's well worth looking at um, many different makes out there. Um, Optolong is one popular one, but there are loads of others. Um, look at those uh, filters. Uh, they enable you to remove a majority of the light pollution. Uh, sadly, with LED lights these days, that's getting uh, less and less of an ability to be able to remove that light pollution. Um, but that's also uh, something that I would say is probably quite uh, needed if you're going to be doing this from within your back garden um, in a light polluted area. And then finally, if you are actually looking uh, for a telescope, then definitely start wider than, um, than, than more zoomed in. So when I say wide, I'm talking around the sort of 200, 250 millimeter type mark. Um, I really would recommend against going out and buying a um, 200 millimeter Newtonian telescope um, that is pretty heavy. It's a beast to handle. You've got to collimate it. Um, learn from my mistakes because that's what I did at the end of my first year of astrophotography. Uh, I got seduced by a thousand millimeter telescope and that's not the way to go. Start wide, nebula are big, you're going to be able to get some fantastic images if you start off with this type of kit. One other point about things like uh, larger telescopes is that you're going to need to start um, going down the route of guiding as well. So you'll need a guide scope and you'll need a guide camera and you'll need a computer and the software to be able to manage all of that and control all of that. So that's another reason to start small uh, because in starting small, you don't need all of that um, functionality. You can take shorter length exposures, typically with uh, mounts like the Star Adventurer, you can get two three minute long exposures without any guiding and that's all you really need so yeah start small so tip number two is don't skimp on integration time so what i mean by integration time is that's the total amount of time of exposures when added up and stacked is the time that you've been imaging that particular target so when we take deep sky images we don't just take one hour long exposure and then that's it. Um, what we need to do is take um, shorter sub exposures and then stack those together. That gives us the benefit that if you have some problem with um, with the slewing of your mount and your mount's not capable of tracking for an hour, which I don't think any mounts really are, uh, then if you get a one, one sub exposure that, that doesn't work out well, you just throw it away. And then the next one is likely to be okay. So that's why we, we split these exposures up and then we have to integrate them. So it's integration time. So stacking is that process where you take your all of your sub exposures, you put them into a tool like Deep Sky Stacker. Uh, you would add all of your calibration frames, which I'm gonna be talking about in a minute. And you get the, the tool to basically stack all of those images together. So it's building up the signal to noise ratio. So the signal is the thing that you're actually imaging that's what you want to get the detail of the nebula the galaxy etc and then you've got the noise side of things so we're using a camera which will have uh, the iso setting or the gain setting uh, reasonably high to be able to um, detect those really faint uh, nebula in the night sky um, and with that noise you actually want to get rid of that noise you don't want that so the stacking process gives you this ability to be able to Keep the, keep the signal and get rid of the noise. So that's all very important. The, the key thing with this is with integration time. The more integration time you have, the better the signal, uh, the lower the noise that you will get from your integrated image. So I first started imaging with Andromeda and figured that, yeah, I can get away with a little bit of noise. It doesn't really matter. So I'll just do about 30 minutes worth of integration time. And as you can see with the image on the screen, it, it didn't really sort of pan out that well. When you're trying to stretch the image after integrating it and stacking it, uh, you can't really pull out those details. So you need more and more integration time. And then finally this in image, which is around about 17 hours of integration time, you can see that there's a lot more detail that you can pull out when you're actually processing the image um, and get a much better image from it. The sponsor of today's video is brilliant.org. Brilliant is a fantastic website for anyone wanting to learn about STEM. 
Whether you're a complete beginner or have more advanced understanding, then Brilliant is for you. One reason why I love Brilliant is because I always love learning new things. That's why I started astrophotography in the first place. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from foundational and advanced math to AI, data science, and neural networks, and much more, with new lessons added monthly. Brilliant provides a fantastic and interactive learning experience which engages the student and is far better than staring at textbooks. You can get a free 30-day trial today by heading to brilliant.org forward slash UK, and the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual subscription. So tip number three is take your calibration frames. Cannot stress this point anymore. Um, so calibration frames are your dark frames, your bias frames, your flat frames, and also your dark flat frames, depending on the camera and whether you need them. These, these frames uh, are, are critical to making sure that you can get the best out of the images that you're actually taking. So the light frames are that people talk about are the frames that they're actually the, the, the subject that you're imaging. Uh, flat frames are there to be able to uh, remove things like sort of dust motes, dust spots, uh, vignetting and um, artifacts like that that you would actually get in your light frames. And then your darks and your bias frames are there to remove the noise. So when we talked about earlier on about increasing that signal to noise ratio, then um, yep, stacking helps with that but also with uh, dark frames and bias frames you can then begin to remove noise even further so that way you get a cleaner image and when you're stretching that image you can um, stretch that to get the detail out but not to actually start stretching and pulling the detail out and the noise as well so uh, very critical to make sure that you do your calibration frames and that you include that in your integration so tip number four is um, focus on learning post-processing techniques. So uh, image capture is obviously important. You want to make sure that your light frames are as good as they can possibly be, that you don't have trailing stars and things like that. And you've been through the whole calibration and stacking phase. And you, so you've got those images um, as best as you can possibly get them. Then you're into the, the stage of post-processing. So when you open up the image within your, say, either Photoshop or um, Affinity Photo, or if you're uh, lucky enough to have something like PixInsight or Astro Pixel Processor, yeah, you'll have to do a lot of work to actually get the final image out. And that can be quite a daunting task to begin with. It's not something that uh, you tend to expect when you're doing daytime photography. You take an image with your camera, look at the screen on the back of the camera and you've got a, a pretty usable image straight away. That's not the same from an astrophotography perspective. So you're going to need to learn to get to grips with uh, a lot of post-processing. Um, my advice in here, this might be a bit controversial. Uh, lots of people might already have things like Photoshop already or Affinity Photo. And those tools, you can process those images and get the best out of them but I'd say they're more sort of generic tools for general image processing. If you're serious about astrophotography and you can see that you're gonna be getting into it for a long period of time, then I would recommend that you start to look at uh, more specialist software, software like PixInsight, which um, I avoided using for a while. It was very daunting. The UI was a bit sort of uh, intimidating at, at the start. But actually, once you get to grips with a few of those um, sort of simple flows of using the tool, you'll get some fantastic images out with relative ease in comparison to trying to use something like Photoshop. So uh, that's my recommendation there is, is to look at that. Um, but also, again, going back to the point of use the tools that you've got and the software that you've got. If you've already got Photoshop or you use GIMP or whatever, uh, there's plenty of tutorials out there which will help you learn and understand your processing. Um, but don't forget the fact that you won't get an image straight out of the uh, out of the camera, out of the integration and the stacking that you can then just print out and put up on your yes. wall. You've got to do I'm a lot more work. To be frivolous. And thank you very much, Siri, for interrupting. My uh, final tip is really just one of um, enjoy doing what you're doing and uh, just be patient. Uh, the hobby of astrophotography um, is, is definitely one which requires a lot of patience, a lot of perseverance, a lot of learning, 
a lot of diagnosing problems and issues with kit and all of those sorts of things that that can at times be times be quite frustrating. And my advice there is to um, stick with it and work through it. The sense of achievement that you get out of the end of um, a night's imaging and a night's troubleshooting and things like that is um, is very rewarding. And then when you get an image right at the end of it that you can share with other people and say, I did this, um, is, is absolutely key. So uh, astrophotography can be quite an isolating hobby. Uh, part of the reasons why I started astrophotography in the first place back in 2020 was a little thing called COVID that happened, um, which meant that I couldn't go anywhere. So what could I do with photography um, in my back garden? I could have looked at macro, etc. But um, actually, I got inspired to do uh, astrophotography through some various other YouTubers. Um, so, yes, it's quite an isolated hobby. However, there is a very good community out there. Um, look on various social media platforms and you should find some very good, very supportive um, other individuals. There are also some people out there that um, aren't too helpful, so uh, you can just avoid them and move on. Um, but yeah, use use this hobby as something to uh, go out and make friends and um, yeah, just enjoy uh, the night sky together. And uh, I think you'll find that the hobby is incredibly rewarding. So I think I'll leave it at that. Um, if you have any other tips that you want to share with anybody else in this channel, then uh, please feel free to put a comment in the uh, comment section below. Thank you very much for watching and clear skies.